This gun of the hand is for the taking of human life. We believe it is wrong to take life. That is only for God. Many times wars have come. And people have said to us, you must fight, you must kill. It is the only way to preserve the good. But Samuel, there is never only one way. Remember that. Would you kill another man? So welcome to the new season, season nine of 15 Minute Film Fanatics. We are really excited because, of course, we're bringing video, Mike. How cool is this? It's great. We've, we've recommitted to you, America. We have. We have recommitted to you. So before we start, we just want to thank you. This is, uh, we've just crossed the three-year mark of doing this show. We've done 180 of them. 180 something so these are all new on video we're going to see how this goes you can follow us here on youtube at 15 min film please subscribe please follow the audio version of this wherever you get your podcast but again thank you so much so mike what are we doing today we're doing 1985's witness uh one of my favorite movies i don't i think you just saw it for the first time is that right i didn't see it for the first time i saw it for the first time since i saw it in high school and I and wonder- and Mike had seen this a couple of days ago and, and Mike said, it's so good. Mike said, you, you said, I watch this movie all the time. And I said, I haven't seen it since it came out. Mike in his usual fashion sent me a, a string of exclamation points. So in part one, we always talk about our overall take on the film. You want me to give you mine? I do. Okay, so um, the big buzz when this came out, I remember in 1985 was it was going to be Harrison Ford's first movie where he wasn't like Han Solo or Indiana Jones. He was going to wear a tie. He was going to play this cop named John Book and stuff like that. It, first of all, it's, it's unbelievably great. And it reminds me very much of a movie we've done already that we both love. And that movie is, it's from 2000. You called it a pair of star-crossed lovers get their noodles in the mood for love. This reminds you of In the Mood for Love? It does. It does remind me of In the Mood for Love. Why? Because you have people from from two different worlds and two different Venn diagrams who desperately want those Venn diagrams to cross over, and and they can't. In Witness, they touch a tiny bit when he comes out and kisses her at the end, but the the movie's about those those magnetic opposites, you know, staying strong. And the magnets get to touch a tiny bit, but it's it's about them knowing that, that, that he can't stay there and she can't go with him. It's funny that you say that he was supposed to play a non-Han Solo character because this strikes me as Han Solo is a cop in Philly. <laughs> Did you get the same impression? Yeah, sure. I mean, he's but still Harrison Ford. He's he's still Harrison Ford, but the whole movie works for whatever reason, start to finish. Uh, it's it's very compelling. It's scary. You have no idea what's going to happen. I, I thought that that little kid uh, was totally going to get murdered, and that's what the rest of the movie was about. Um but they used to. This used to be like the U picks nine or U picks eleven movie yeah. when I was a kid, and they would edit out uh, the the parts that I'm sure that you know what I'm talking about. The bathtub and, and scene. Play maybe yeah the bathtub scene and play maybe 85 minutes of the movie plus commercials. So I I used to watch it all the time in the 90s. I love it. I love that it's about two people you know trying desperately to be true to their codes. But it it, it to use one of our favorite podcast things. This should not work on paper. This movie should not, or it would be a terrible like Hallmark Christmas movie or something like, like he's a cop, she's Amish. And when they meet, watch out. Like it should be, it should be so much worse than it is. It should be like the classic fish out of water movie, but it, and it, it toys with that a little bit. Like I think when they dance in the barn with um, what a wonderful world it would be playing on the thing. That's, that's a little bit, a little bit Hallmark. It's okay, but it pulls back. Um, but it's still a great, great movie about two people trying to be true to the groups to which they belong and to the values they have. For me though, that they buy that moment and they they buy that moment in two ways. There's one where uh, where he wakes up after the gunshot wound uh, and he sees all the Amish people standing around his bed yeah. and they're deciding whether to let him die or not. And you could tell some, the opinion of some of the people in the room is just <laughs> let him die, bury his body here and nobody will ever know he existed, which is which is very sinister. And then the other moment is when they go downtown so he can make his phone call and try to call his partner and they run into the people in the car uh, who smear the guy's face with right. ice cream. It's like a, it's like a reverse Panin moment where 
you know, back on the reservation, uh, the guy that they that they smear the ice cream, you know, his rival uh, is is like the big man on campus. But out in the street, he's just some Amish dude. Well, and you know what it, that good. You know what that scene is that that's the scene. That's the Wolverine scene. That's the absolutely. scene like in every Wolverine movie where someone's got to pick a fight with with Wolverine and find out he's going to get his butt kicked. Right. Somebody just came back from killing the, his favorite bear. You know, and <laughs> right. starting, starting that's fight. exactly what it's like. But I think it's great. Like they both try to be true. Like like John Book wants to be true to what he believes is the idea of the, of the police force. Right. You go after crooked guys. You don't let them get away with these things. And then she, of course, is trying to be true to like what, what she's been raised by, what she believes. And the grandfather tries to be true. Like, we're not going to have any guns or violence. And they both have a point, which is interesting. It's not like like you're, you you want Harrison Ford to close the case. You want the bad guys to get punished. But you also kind of want them to be together. But you know they can't be. And I think the movie never cheats and never makes that easy. I like evil Danny Glover a lot. Um, for whatever reason, evil Danny Glover worked. I've... Have I ever seen another movie in which he's the villain? Can you think of one off the top of your head? No. It's really difficult for me. No. And then uh, I forget which actor it is. I'm not super familiar with him who plays uh, Harrison Ford's evil captain uh, who's in on the whole drug right. thing. But the best thing about it is when he makes that call to the local departments to try to find yeah. uh, the kid's last name and the guy tell you, you have absolutely no chance. Isn't that like every service call you've ever made in your life? That's exactly <laughs> like calling Comcast or something. Well, what's great about that is that in every police movie, of course, you make one phone call and within three seconds, you know exactly where the guy is, where he eats breakfast, who his brother is. And the guy's like, no, there's two, they're not phones and you can't do it. And and then I found out that this movie was directed by friend of the show, Peter Weir. Big friend who, of the show. Who did, who's done Master and Commander. He did Picnic at Hanging Rock. Uh, I don't, he, that guy's a chameleon. Every yeah. single movie he makes is different, but I liked it just as much as I like Hanging Rock or master and commander and there's there's me i don't know if you'd call it a tonal quality or just a quality quality but there's something well made about a peter weir movie no he's great all right in part two we'll talk about our favorite moments okay welcome back so part two we always talk about our favorite moment or a moment we think epitomizes the movie mike what's yours uh mine is when he first sits down and he does the folgers honey that's great coffee uh which is not only uh is not only cheesy but it, it's sort of a condensed version of the scene that you were talking about where they dance to uh what a wonderful yeah. world it would be but the the lack of reaction is not just funny it's it's not just like being a fish out of water it's like it's like being a fish out of brackish water or something where you don't realize what the quality of the water is until you're out uh and i, I think that later when he's ready to go back to his world, but not quite ready to leave theirs. That's the reason why I don't think he's ever been outside of his milieu yeah. ever. And so it's, it's, it's startling that he should go to Amish country. That's, you know, that's as far opposite, I guess, as, as they could imagine, but uh, th they do their best to illustrate what a child uh, of the 60s that that he is and I don't think that there's anything better than that commercial yeah no that's terrific and I and it's also interesting that we get the side plot where his sister says you know he has no when when his sister is telling Kelly McGillis oh she says you have no family she says you know you like to be in a cop because then he always gets to be right and things like that so you can see like that's what his whole life is invested in is, is the Philadelphia police force. And when he was out of that, he just, all he can do is resort to being awkward. And it's very cool to see Harrison Ford of all people be awkward, isn't it? It's, it's unthinkable unless, you know, he, he, it's just that he's a good actor that he's able to right. pull it off because you, you get the feeling that everything Harrison Ford does is cool. Right. Um, I like the way that they use his sister for the role. She, she must be in the movie all of six minutes, but it feels like she's in more of the movie. Yeah. And I think it's because, they ha she has that dialogue with Kelly McGillis versus having it with Harrison Ford because when they talk, there's um, they don't explain anything. They're they're having one of those arguments that you're meant to overhear. Yeah, that that fills in the plot, but it's done in a in a really smooth way. Because if Patty Lapone told Harrison Ford, you know, this is why you became a police officer. You know, you should have a family. In re in real life, John Book would just roll his eyes and be like, goodbye. He'd walk out of the house. So you have to get that information to the viewer somehow. So she uses Kelly. They use Kelly McGillis as the conduit to the information. Yeah, the the best thing is when he comes in and he he rolls his eyes and he says, 
the guys upstairs yeah. with the kids in the house. Right. And that that paints the entire that that gives yeah. you the whole thing. Which is great, of course, because he doesn't have any kids. And that's exactly what she's thinking. Like, well, what are you who are you to give me a lecture? But you could tell he's been lecturing her for years. <clears throat> What's your moment? So my moment is I was going to cheat because my first moment was going to be when he drinks the lemonade. <laughs> I thought that was great. When she's like, I can, I can straight stay true to my values, except when I watch this carpenter drink this lemonade. Oh boy. But that, you know, we kind of covered that in part one. My real moment is kind of silly, but I think it's a really good thing. It's that when Harrison Ford is healing and her father says, okay, you got to come to work. And he says, sure, I'll, I'll come work now. Right. And he says, okay, milking begins at 430. It's 430. Wake up. It's time for milking. So he gets up to milk the cow. Now that should be a classic wah, 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 like city slicker trying to grow, you know, I've had ones bigger than this, haha, <laughs> trying to milk the cow. But what I loved in that scene is that he says to him, the grandfather says to uh, Harrison Ford, here's your milking hat. Remember he gives him the milking hat and he puts the milking hat on. Now, do you remember what the milking hat looks like? No. It's the same hat everyone wears, right? Except the brim is off. It looks like he looks like a, it looks like a fez or he looks like a bellboy, a bellhop or something. So I'm watching the movie and I'm like, why does he have the, like, why is that the milking hat? Like, why do you have to wear a hat at all? Well, you have to wear a hat because you're on this, right? But the reason it's a milking hat is because when you lean in next to the cow, you can't have the brim of the hat bang next to the cow, right? So I'm watching it and I'm like, ah. Oh. And I thought that was really cool because. A, it's not explained in the movie. You have to, you have to understand it and figure it out. But it's just another example of how you enter the world with Harrison Ford and you kind of have to learn all these little kind of things, like how to build a barn or how to do this or how to do that. Make sure you say grace even before you have hot dogs on the street in Philadelphia. So I just love that Milking Hat is just one of many, many things the movie does right by giving you these little entrees into that world. And you kind of have to figure them out at the same time he does. Yeah, and the the moment for me that really does it or the image that that does it that's still vivid in my mind is when his blue car he he's passed out at the wheel slowly rolls over and then crushes their birdhouse, the birdhouse. Slash mailbox and and takes it down you know really so it's like the slowest motion crash in any movie you'll ever see but it's two worlds colliding yes which of course and of course what does he do at the end of the movie he fixes that birdhouse Welcome back. So in part three, of course, we talk about the title, the ending, the key takeaways. Dan, what's your key takeaway? Well, first, of course, that the movie should have been retitled Death by Corn, but we'll leave that for a little bit. That was a great scene. But a couple of things that I think are great about the ending. The first is that how much it reminds, and I don't know if this was conscious enough by the by when they made the film, but how much is this like High Noon? It's exactly high noon. Right? You have the pacifist wife who, I mean, she doesn't pull out the gun like Grace Kelly does, but you have this guy, you have the three guys, he, he knows they're coming to kill me. There's that great scene where they come over the ridge, right? And he's got to kind of outsmart them. I, 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 I couldn't stop thinking about Gary Cooper. But he's also kind of in the same kind of thing. He's like, that the movie says like, high noon tells you, you can't just be Grace Kelly because these guys are still going to come after you. And so I think the same kind of thing goes on in The Witness. So that's what that's what I think is great about it. it. It's just again, High Noon is also a movie about two Venn diagrams coming together. Now he and Grace Kelly go off at the end; they make it. Luckily, at the end of this film, that's the other thing I wanted to say. At the end of this film, there's no scene where they're like, "We'll make it work," or he goes out in the car like a cheesier movie. He would have started driving away, and she would have run out of the house saying, "Wait, wait, stop!" You know, taking off her bonnet, and and you would have died inside. And it's so much better that even when they say goodbye, right? They don't really say anything because what are they going to say? They have no hope. Yeah, they have no hope, right? But but, it, but in the best possible way for me, the viewer. Yeah, but you know what? They'll always have Paris, as Bogart tells her. You know, they'll always have Paris. So what is your take on the ending of the title? Well, I mean, the, okay, the, the title's obvious, which is the, the boy is the witness. But the thing that struck me is I think that this movie is billed mostly as Harrison Ford being a witness to the way that they're living in the Amish country. And as you kind of correctly said, without making a parody of the Amish country, you know, right. there's a couple of moments like when he puts on the suit and they say, you look plain, right. you know, which is ha ha. Right. Um, but what I had forgotten about rewatching it is how much of the first part of the movie is about uh, two Amish people venturing into English land. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and how they witness their mode of life. And how judgmental they are about that mode of life, which is fantastic. When she's at the train station, she doesn't want him to go anywhere or do anything. When they when they stay with um, John Book's sister for the first time, right. and she, 
she's collecting all the facts about her and can't believe the way that she's living, the the way that they look around uh, on the street or, you know, try not to even engage with the English because they're, they just want to fight and yeah. stir you up. Um, and so it would be, I think it would be very easy or a little bit too simple and pat to say that it's about, um, you know, somebody from the 1980s trying to experience Amish land. It really is about both, cultures witnessing one another and of course the the classic thing is that the first the kid's first time out he does in fact get into trouble which uh which i like can make which makes kelly mcgillis's father go, see i told it, you no, but exactly right right because the, the lesson would be like it's not so bad out there they're not so different after all but it is it is dangerous it's totally <laughs> different and neither can live in the other's world at all yeah i love what you said about that 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 they are as judgmental as the people that live in Philadelphia, right? Because again, a lesser filmmaker would have made the Amish like close to like, you know, they would have been like Forrest Gump or something. They would have been out there like totally, aren't they? But but they have their family arguments. They have their hangups, the, the same thing as everybody else. And 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 also like, that's why it's so funny in the beginning where you first see the buggy and the, the credits comes on, it says Pennsylvania, 1985. It has to come on or you think you're watching the Crucible or something, but it's- no, yeah, that's, that's the most informative title maybe in any movie, you know, cause, yeah. cause, nor- cause normally it's like in front of the Eiffel tower and it says Paris 1970 and everybody's wearing, you know, bell bottoms or something. Exactly. Um, exactly. No, I'm, I'm totally with you, but I, and I'm thinking specifically of the moment when, Kel- when Kelly McGillis is picking up all the facts about John book's sister and the way that she's living and, and clearly um, silently disapproving, like with every cell of her being. Right. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the movie's not interested in selling the characters to you. But it knows that if it just stays there long enough, you'll get used to it, which you do. Yeah, which you do, which you do. And that's why the ending works so well. That's why when, that's why when he leaves, it makes sense and you're satisfied and you're a little bit, you're not even like bummed out that they can't be together because it would be, it would be, you'd be lying to yourself. Thanks for listening, everybody. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation about Witness. You could subscribe to the show here on YouTube or on Twitter. Follow us on Letterboxd at 15MAN Film. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe. Please leave us reviews. Leave us comments in the comment section below and let us know what movies you'd like us to do. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.